Good afternoon. I'd like to talk to you today about uh, our relationships, really. Um, the most important relationship I can think of, and one that I've been fairly negligent of over the years, uh, is my relationship with the planet. And the whole of this talk is really about that relationship, about the way we are with our planet. And many of the uh, ways in which I've spent uh, my life over the last few years have been trying to do less harm, try to live a bit more modestly, try to um, do things which are actually having less of an impact. Now, I've spent quite a lot of time engaged in that process, and I found myself thinking for a while that there's something not terribly satisfying about the way I've been behaving. There was something missing. And in any relationship, what you don't want to do is spend your life thinking about the things that you really don't want to do within the relationship. You want to think about the positive things. My nemesis was this humble paper towel dispenser. Now, one night I was working late in the office and my hands got grubby from using um, lots of papers that I was reading. So I thought, right, I need to go through and I need to wash my hands. And now right next to my room was a wash hand basin in a little shower room. So I walked into the room, so I went in, and I thought, right, I'll put the light switch on so I know where the sink is. And I thought, no, I know where the sink is. I don't need to turn the light on. I'll just go across in the dark. So I went across in the dark, and I went to turn the hot tap on. I thought, no, 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 you put soap on your hands first, boy. You don't mess about with a hot water tap. So I put some soap on my hands, and I went, no, I don't need hot water. Cold water will do fine. So I got the minimum amount of cold water, and I rinsed my hands. So I was very self-satisfied then. I'd done all this in the dark, and then I reached for the paper towel. Now that's where I made a really serious mistake because the person before me had taken a paper towel. They weren't thinking about the planet at all, of course. And as I pulled my hand away in horror, realizing that I didn't need the paper towel, this happened. A little tiny bit of leftover paper towel came away on my wet hand and drifted to the floor. So I thought, no, I can't leave litter. I've got to pick this up. So I went down to pick up the bit of paper. I got to this point and I thought, uh-uh, I can't see it, it's dark in here. I'm gonna have to grub about on the floor and find my bit of paper, which will make my hands dirty. If it makes my hands dirty, then I need to wash them again. Ah, I'll go and switch the light on. No, I can't switch the light on because that defeats the whole purpose of not switching the light on in the first place. What do I do? What do I do? So I stayed there for about as long as my leg muscles would manage and I'm not a very fit person, so it wasn't very long. And I thought, no, I'll need to come back in the morning and get that piece of paper towel. Now, the point is that that's a kind of eco-paralysis. That doesn't do anybody any good at all. And I became really dissatisfied with the way in which I was embracing the sustainability issue. Um, and it made me think of, of, of this. It made me think of, of my, my grandparents uh, and their garden. Now, these were probably the most sustainable people I've ever known in my life. This jacket my grandfather's wearing was probably 20 years old. Um, it's the only jacket he ever had in his life. And I was made from vegetables from that garden. Now, you don't get much more local than that. And when did you last think about where you were made from? I'm not talking about what you were made from, where you were made from. Now, this is a very strange concept, but of course, what this is saying to me is I need to develop a relationship. I need to develop a relationship with my planet because my planet sustains me. So I was made from vegetables from that garden. This is the ceremonial opening of the greenhouse. This is a proper use of the greenhouse effect. My father and I built for my grandfather. And we lived in, uh, in houses where we were heated by, they were heated by coal. And it was many years later that I realized that fossil fuels meant fossil fuels, like they came from things that fell down into bogs like coal and things that drifted down through the oceans that turned into oil. So um, that was, I suppose, the, the, the awakening of a realization that we were having an impact on our planet because we were burning fossil fuels. Now, um, I'd like a little bit of help here. Somebody's going to hold the rope for me. Thank you. Now, I don't know whether you know too much about the geology of fossil fuels, but uh, they were laid down, all the, all, the, all the fossil fuels we're using were laid down in a period of about 58 million years, about 300 plus million years ago. Now, to scale, this bit of rope is 5.8 meters, so that's 58 million years, okay? Now, during that time, 
all the fossil fuels were laid down. We have been around as a species about two and a half centimeters on the end of this, okay? So that's us, we've been around. The time that we've used these fossil fuels up over is 250 years, really, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And to scale, I better not do this too often, it's about the external diameter of a human hair. In 250 years, we've used all but, thank you, all of the fossil fuels that we can easily access. So we've been doing stuff at a fairly hectic rate in terms of using these, these fuels. And of course, they're contributing to what we now know as a different kind of greenhouse effects. Now, how do we know this? Well, there's tens of thousands of years, of years worth of records that people make access, uh, gain access to, to make the calculations. And of course, there are tens of thousands of scientist years invested in the process of understanding our impact on the planet, both in terms of climate change and, and biodiversity. Now, I'm intrigued that we seem to trust experts of all different sorts. So we trust the people who fly our planes and the people who maintain them. We trust people who fix our cars, people who fix our bodies, and indeed people who do the most important job of all, fix our phones and our computers when they're bust. We even trust cake experts. So when Mary Berry says that's the best cake, we just trust her, okay? If Paul Hollywood says it's the best cake as well, then we really know we're in business. They know what they're talking about. So why is it then that we're a bit circumspect about trusting the experts when they're scientists, at least conditionally? We'll trust them with all sorts of stuff, but when they say stuff that we aren't terribly keen on, then we start to be a bit mistrustful. I can sort of understand why people don't trust the United Nations when they say the planet's warming. They don't trust the United Nations when they say that biodiversity is in serious collapse. But when they don't trust David Attenborough, then I'm really suspicious. So why is it that we don't trust scientists in perhaps the way we should? Uh, is it that these issues are too complex, too difficult, too far away, too much in the future? Or is it that our relationship is broken? Uh, we don't have enough of an intimate relationship with the planet to really care about it. Well, my friend Peter Martin has this notion of nature's friend or nature's kin, nature's family. And he says, Imagine you're driving home late one night, and as you're driving up the road, if there's a snowstorm or it's pouring with rain. And as you're coming by this broken down car, you glimpse two people trying to deal with it, and you think, never seen those in my life. Do you drive on or do you stop and help? Now, what I'd like you to do is put your hands up if you would always stop. You don't know these people at all. It's late at night, you wanna get home. Put your hands up if you would always stop. There's a few saints in the audience, brilliant. Okay, now here's the next question. You're doing the very same thing and you think, actually, I recognize that person. It's somebody in my street. I've never spoken to them. I'm a bit kind of, well, I don't know quite what they're like, but will I stop? All right, who's gonna stop now? Hands up. More of you. Okay, now here's the next one. As you drive by, you think, hell's bells, that's actually two of my family members here dealing with that car. I know that car, I know those people. Are you gonna stop now? Hands up. There's a couple of people who haven't put their hands up there. <laughs> okay, well, maybe you haven't put your hands up because you know what the next slide is. You're absolutely excused for not stopping if you see this happening. Um, but you're unlikely to. So Peter's argument is that you need to think about nature as friend. You need to think about nature as some entity that you have a relationship with, and then you'll think differently about it. So we've got to the point that we understand nature as friend. Okay, now, maybe we're gonna have a, a bit of a more intimate relationship with this planet of ours. So uh, we'll do a little bit of compatibility testing here, a little bit of uh, speed dating. Okay, so here's, um, here's a test to see whether or not you're compatible in this relationship with your planet. Right, so here's, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you some answers and I want you to come up with the questions. Now, you know those terrible teachers at school who would ask you a question, you'd come up with the answer, you'd think you'd really know the answer. And they'd say, no, that's fine, but it's not the one I'm looking for, right? Well, there's gonna be a bit of that now. Okay, so you've got the gist. You give me the question, I give you the answer. So, the answer is four minutes, so what's the question? Pardon? Oh, dear me, did you hear that? How long can you hold your breath for? This person's obviously seen this presentation before <laughs> because this is my hint, okay? 
And along with the hint is, this is the most important thing that your body could possibly know. If you get this wrong, you're going to die within four minutes. Okay. Now, the person who's going to get this prize, it's you, David Somerville, is it? See, he's heard, heard this before. So why am I giving him this prize? Come on, David, you can come and collect this. Snowdrops from my garden. Why am I giving David snowdrops from my garden? You can sit down on the floor, <laughs> by the way. There is a clear reason for this. The reason is the plant produces the oxygen that we breathe. It absorbs the carbon dioxide that we produce through burning fossil fuels that we produce by exhaling and soaks up that carbon dioxide through a process called photosynthesis. You're all familiar with it. Photo light synthesis growth. It releases oxygen as the plant grows. Without these plants, we would die. Okay. Now, you can shut up this time. <laughs> the answer is four days. What's the question? How long can you cope without what somebody said water? Yes, so that's clearly somebody's voice I can recognize. How long without water? Here's your water here in this bottle. You can claim this prize afterwards if you want. So water. So without water, of course, we would only last four days. Now, isn't it miraculous that this stuff falls out of the sky and then comes out of the taps? That's an incredible thing. We just take it for granted. We absolutely take it for granted. I used to work in the water industry, and believe me, it, I still think of it as a miracle that we get clean water out of our taps. It's a mark of civilization as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so here's the next one. So the answer is four weeks. What's the question? How long can you last without food? So what I have here are potatoes. Now, thinking back, I was made from vegetables from that garden. I was made from potatoes in particular from that garden. So your prize is a bunch of potatoes from my garden. Okay, you can have them. They're quite nice, actually. My son planted them. They're brilliant. Oh, okay. Now, the Scots polymath philosopher who came up really with the idea of thinking global and acting local, the idea really of, of sustainability is Sir Patrick Geddes. Now, about 100 years ago, he said this, by leaves we live. He could have summarized everything I've just said in that one phrase, by leaves we live. Now, he was a great one for the, in those days, what you would call tweets today or sound bites, okay. So, by leaves we live, he had many others as well. Um, I think he could have said, I am biogeochemical cycles. Bit clunky, but you know, it might work, especially if you break up the idea of biogeochemical. The idea of bio, geo, and chemical. It's not complicated, it's a big word, and actually, I think you might be able to tell me what that big lizard was you saw earlier on. What was it? Anybody like to tell me? The one that was in the, uh, in the image with the upturned car? T-Rex. Okay, Tyrannosaurus Rex, to give it its proper name. You can cope with very big, long words sometimes. The average five-year-old could tell you it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So biogeochemical isn't actually too complicated. So here's a couple of less than five-year-olds. And really what I'm saying is that we are part of nature. We aren't separate from it, we are part of it. And of course, if you spend time in nature, then you start to develop a relationship that works with nature. Now, I'm about to kind of finish up now with the last couple of slides, and, and really what I'd like to do is, first of all, wish you well in developing your relationship with the planet. A default mechanism, one where you're always in deficit of trying to do the least harmful things you can, is important, but trying to build a positive relationship so you know why you're doing it, why you care about your planet, why you care about nature, why you care about people in other parts of the world is a very important construct, and it helps to motivate us to do things. My final image is of the planet Neptune. This was an image taken by the Voyager space probe, um, and it took about 12 years for it to get there at 42,000 miles an hour. So there are those people who think we might colonize other planets. Well, they are profoundly wrong, of course, because we're not going to do this. Ban Ki-moon had this wonderful phrase, there is no plan B because there's no planet B. To finish, I'd just like to think that I had the temerity to end his quote for him and suggest that what he probably really meant to say was, there's no plan B because there's no planet B. 
and we couldn't grow potatoes there anyway. Thank you. Thank you.